the word of our faith in Scripture. As we hear it and as we are nurtured and fed, may we also be challenged that we may become those people of faith in our discipleship that you call us to be. I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Well, I don't know about you, but sometimes uh, when I read a passage in Scripture, I sometimes find it hard to understand what's going on. What is this writer trying to say that maybe I need to hear? And I think there are times also when I read Scripture, when I read a particular passage and I say, do I really believe that? Hmm, I wonder. And yet it's by being able to ask those questions and have those kind of reflections that keep the Scriptures alive for me. They come to life. They're relevant. And they're not just words on a page of a book that I read. They're not just words that I process in my mind, but equally they are thoughts and, and, and things that God blesses me with in that moment, blesses me in my heart and in my soul, as I ask myself, so what's the truth that God wants me to hear? It may be a difficult truth, it may be a challenging truth, but what is the truth that God wants me to hear in this moment? with these words. Truth for my own life. Truth for the world we live in. Well, our second reading for today is one of those passages that causes people to sometimes sit back and take a second thought. What is James really saying in that passage? And this passage has presented a conundrum for the church over the centuries. And in fact, it was this passage that was at the center of the Reformation. Martin Luther had great difficulty with James. He didn't like James at all. And he actually advocated that the book of James be taken out of the canon of Scripture. Imagine the audacity of that. And why did he feel that? He said, because Words like the ones we heard read this morning, they contradict Paul's teaching and they contradict the central message of the gospel that Jesus proclaimed about what it means to have faith. He was heard to describe the writings of James as the epistle of straw. And why did he describe it as the epistle of straw? Because he said it has no foundation. There's nothing of the true nature of the gospel in what James has to say. And the particular line that he was talking about was when James says, faith by itself, if it has no works, is what? Dead. Faith without works is dead. I like the way Eugene Peterson translates it in his uh, translation, The Message. He says, God talk without God acts is outrageous nonsense. Do you think that's true? You can't interpret what James is saying to mean we can work our way into heaven. If I just do one more thing, I'm one step closer. It could mean that our salvation depends on all the good acts of kindness and generosity and faithfulness that we do. And you know how in school, on a test, you can get bonus marks? It's like getting an extra check mark beside our name in God's book because of all those good things we've done and accomplished. It could be interpreted in that way. And personally, I don't think that's the way it works. I'm with Martin Luther on that. Jesus was pretty clear. And so was Paul in the teaching of, to the early Christian church. He said, how are we saved? We are saved by God's grace and by God's grace alone. So when James actually, uh, I caught myself thinking about it this morning as I heard it read, when James says, can faith save you? And then he goes on to say, I don't know. My answer to that is yes. Jesus says faith is what saves us. 
The good news of the gospel is that we are saved by God's grace and by God's grace alone. We don't and we can't earn our salvation. And thankfully, it is a free gift that God gives us through Jesus Christ with no strings attached. We can't work our way into heaven and into God's good books. However, there is a but. And that but that is there in that theological statement of faith is what I think James is trying to get at and what James is actually saying, even though he's been misunderstood so much over time. James is offering us a guide to how we can live out our lives faithfully as followers of Jesus Christ. James gives us a picture of a disciple working to build the kingdom and involved intentionally in sharing the promise of the gospel. Earlier in that passage from James, he says, I love this word. Don't let public opinion influence how you live out your glorious Christ-originated faith. In other words, what he's saying is, don't be swayed by the world you live in. Know the gift of God's blessing, because God has blessed you with faith. The seed of faith that God planted in you. And God has shown you that faith through giving you the gift of his Son, Jesus Christ. And God has made known to us the promise that he has made to each of us because we are all his children. And now, what James says is, now, live in a way that shares that abundantly. Share it with those you meet, those you interact with, those you are in a relationship. And when you share it with them, they will be blessed too as you are blessed by the love, the mercy, the grace of God that they too will receive in their lives. And how does James tell us to do that? Well, he makes it pretty clear. He quotes Jesus. Imagine that. He quotes Jesus and the great commandment and the golden rule, which is love others as you love yourself. Love others as you love yourself. It's that simple, he says. So what James is saying is not only if, but when our faith is alive in us, we won't be able to, to help but live it out tangibly in good works, in the ministries that God calls us to, in the works of justice that we enter into. Our faith in Jesus Christ and our relationship with Jesus means so much to us that it propels us into action. We can't sit back and do nothing. We can't stand by and do nothing. When someone in front of us is in pain, suffering and grieving, crying, when they're living in poverty or sleeping in a bus shelter, we can't stand by and say nothing when people are living with injustice. Those on the margins of our society, the most vulnerable who can't speak for themselves, those who live every day with fear of what might happen to them if they do speak up. We are propelled into action because of what and who we believe in. And Jesus Christ, the one that we follow. And the truth is the gospel would substantiate that. And Paul preached it. As James said, maybe if there isn't life in our faith, through action, perhaps it is dead. Not worthless. But not as much at the center of who we are and who we're called to be and who we are called to become. And I think there's truth in that. And I think Martin Luther would even agree with that and support it too. One of tell you a story that's an analogy of it. And it's about a rower in a boat. And he's trying to get from this side of the river to that side of the river. And in his boat, he has two oars. And he's named them. One is faith, and one is works. And someone comes along and says to him, so why did you name your oars? And he decides, I'm not going to tell you his words, I'm going to show you. 
So he puts the faith oar down in the bottom of the boat. And he says to the person, now I want to get to the other side. And I'm going to use this paddle that says works, and I'm going to use it, and I'm going to use it, and I'm going to use it, and I'm going to get to the other side. And he starts growing, paddling as hard as he can with the one thing. And do you think he gets to the other side of the river? All he does is he goes in circles, and he goes with the flow down with the current. So he puts that oar in the bottom, and he takes out the faith oar. He says, okay, I'll try this one now. Maybe that'll work. And again, as much as he can. And again, he goes in circles and floats down the river. And then he says to the person, now watch this. And he takes out both oars, faith and works, and uses them together. And where does he end up? The other side. Right? Faith and works go together. And one without the other isn't going to be all that effective. A friend of mine made the comment that just as much as faith without works is dead, works without faith is dead too. Flip it around, and the same thing is true. You need both faith and works. And if we look at history, we've got lots of examples of faithful men and women who professed boldly their faith when they came together as we do in worship. But it didn't end there for they went out those doors and they lived their faith in action. Action that made a difference. So I want to share with you one example, a story that I just heard about this week, even though it's from a book that was written in 1979 and a documentary in 1989. It's an example of a community during World War II in the midst of Holocaust history. And it was the story of pacifist Protestant ministers in this co small community in France, Nazi-occupied France. And they preached and they led their parishioners, and not just their parishioners, but people outside of their churches in the community and their whole region, to shelter 5,000 Jews during the midst of that occupation. And to do it, of course, secretly. It's a powerful story. And I think it's a powerful witness in the documentary, it was called Weapons of the Spirit, and in the book that was called Lest Innocent Blood Be Shed. And in the documentary, when the interviewer inquired about people's motives, the villagers responded as if it was obvious, and it, as if he was asking a ludicrous question. It happened so naturally, we don't know how it happened, it, we don't know what all the fuss is about, we just did it. Another replied, we never analyzed what we were doing, it just happened by itself. Well, I don't think it happened by itself. I think it was the seed of faith that was planted in them and nurtured in them that spurred them into the action of living out their faith in a very tangible way. And it was all in response, not just to the pastor's call, it may have been the pastor at the front preaching, but it was God's call. God's call. And to quote the pastor, he preached that it was the Christian's duty to use the weapon of the Spirit to counter injustice. Put your faith into action, he said. And they did. One of the very few places. And just think for a moment about the potential ramifications if they've been caught. And yet they did it anyway. That's what James was talking about. Our faith is most meaningful to us. Our faith is most alive for us when we put it into action in a way that makes a difference in the building up of the kingdom as we enter into missional moments, allowing God to work and to speak through us. And I hope that we don't want to cave keep making our way in ministry by using only one oar. Because what's going to happen? We're just going to go in circles. Or we're going to go with the flow of society and not be the faithful community of faith that we are called to be. We need both. Otherwise, we could keep going in circles. In truth, if we only use one oar, that's not the gospel. That's not what the 
discipleship is all about. So remember the works of ministry that we are called to. And they don't need to be on a grand scale. They don't have to be on the scale of that community in France during World War II and what they did. It can be doing what we can in that situation that God and that moment that God invites us into. Our faith put into action can be calling a friend having a difficult time. Delivering a casserole to a neighbor who's just come home from a hospital. Driving a friend to a doctor's appointment. Sending a card just to say hi, hope you're doing okay. Putting in hours here at church in many of the different ministries that happen in this place. Volunteering to take a leadership role or to wash dishes after a turkey supper. Cooking for soup lunches, making sandwiches for lunch and learn by being an ally in the Gay Street Alliance, by volunteering at the hospital or the food bank, by praying for someone who's sick, by putting up posters around town for our various events, and the list could go on and on and on and on. We already do put our faith into action. Our faith is far from dead in this place, and we need to remember that. And we need to allow God's Spirit to celebrate that. But we also need to be spurred on into other avenues of ministry too. And at this moment in time, we may not even know what they are. But we need to be open and trusting that indeed God always continues to call us forward. And that when God calls us forward into ministry and mission, so too God will equip us with what we need to do that ministry of mission. Yesterday at the men's breakfast, um, we reflected uh, on the ministry of servanthood. And the reflection ended with this quote. And I said, can I take that book home because that's the ending to my sermon I need. It's a quote from John Wesley. And just listen to it. And I'll say it twice. Do all the good you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as ever you can. Listen again. Do all the good you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as ever you can. May that indeed be so, not just true for us as individuals, but for us as the parish of 